All right, so we can restrict our domain in a natural way, just talk about partial functions rather than entire functions. Uh, now that we have our new toys, functions, what are some operations on functions? The only two ops that we'll talk about functions now is, say, f is going from a set a to a set b. Let's say g is going from a set a to a set b. Then I'll be able to say things like, I wonder what operations on functions uh, become particular about the domain and codomain objects that we're dealing with. So if I have functions like students to chairs, combining functions really kind of would be like, that's kind of awkward. Right? You're telling me that you want to take one function, like you're mapped to these chairs, and I have this go to another room, and I map you to different chairs. What could I do to those two functions that might be a natural thing to do? And the answer is, well, that doesn't seem to make sense. But on the other hand, if, for example, I had a function that was mapping A to a number, and a function that was mapping a to a number, hey, uh, it's kind of like college algebra. I, I think I can handle, what do you think f plus g is? It would seem to be, well, one, maybe I would like it to be closed. So if f and g are functions, f <coughs> plus g should be a function. And so it's going to be a function. And what's a natural thing that we could do? Well, f takes an element and spits out a number. g takes an element and spits out a number. That means if I would say, what would be the sum of these two rules? Well, hey, why don't we just naturally take the two numbers and add them? What's this plus? This plus and this plus are different pluses. Same symbol, different meanings. What's this plus? This plus is it's a function plus a function, so it's some sort of functional addition. What's this plus? Well, once f has mapped x, what does it spit out? A real number. Once g maps, it spits out a real number. And so this plus is a number plus a number, so it's the real number addition, which is a completely different symbol. We can also say, well, what about f times g? Well, I'd like it to be a function still, so I want it to be closed. And what would be natural? Well, let's just say it's f of x times g of x. Guess what? Those are two different symbols. On the other hand, we could have different things, right? We could make some rules to say that, you know what? These plus this times is coming from the concept of your codomain. So what if your codomain was a, a thing that had you know, particular operators? Like, let's say these were functions mapped to functions. So your codomain is just a set of continuous functions. What are things that we could do to continuous functions? Well, from calculus, we know we can integrate them. We could differentiate them. So we could talk about, what about the integral between two functions? What about the derivative? What about differences? What about, depending on what your B, your codomain is, you can do lots of whatever you want. Most times, you pick something that makes sense for what you're working with. For college algebra and calculus, well, this is just college algebra, plus and times makes sense as long as we're going from to, to a real number. It's important to say that these things need to match up. All right, what would be another application that would make sense? Something we're going to call composition. Let's go back to this kind of arrow diagram and say that's a and that's b and I notice that function f goes from a to b. But then I notice that hey look there's another set over here we'll call it c and come on so I got this other set but I notice that g So here's an A, gets mapped over here to a B, gets mapped here to a C, and function G goes from B to C. So I have a rule that takes A's to B's and a different rule that takes B's to C's. Could I take those two rules and give me one grand rule 
that, well, okay, I have a two-step process. I could say, everybody in this room, go to this location. But everybody in that location, go to this location. It's like, why did I have to do that? Why couldn't you have just simply said, go all the way to the end? Because eventually A is going to go to C. Why, why not just skip your middle step? And I would form an ordered pair AC. So I look at this and say, all right, let's write it in terms of notation. I notice that B was F has mapped A to B. What about over here? C. What's happened? G has mapped B to C. All right, but I could put those two together. B is actually equal to that. So if I wanted to, I could have written it this way. G is going to map B, which happens, by the way, to be F of A, which is going to C. This looks like a function. A is going to C. This looks like something has mapped A to C. F went first, then G, and then that's got and sp that has spit out a C. Now, read this. Read this line right here. How would you read that line, somebody? G of F of A is C. G of F of A. All right, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to write it that way. G of F of A is C. And I'm going to say that this hop function, like this, we're going to give it its own name. We're going to call it composition. What's necessary for composition to happen? All right, here's where prefix, infix causes us issues. It would have been nicer if we would have done actual true infix or postfix, because this is in prefix notation. In prefix notation, which function goes first? If you look at this, which function goes first? Which function actually went first? F. Which function goes first? F. Why? Because we go inside out. We go F, then G. Oh, but it's G of F. Yeah, but F goes first. Why? Because we are not going left or right. We're going inside out, which in prefix notation means the right goes before the left. The easiest way to do that is if you have this, write it this way, and then it'll make more sense as you do it. What's necessary? What's absolutely necessary is who's the domain of F, who's the codomain of F, and that codomain of F better be G's domain. And then it'll spit out the codomain of G. Um, if, I, if in, say, actual infix or postfix, it would have actually looked like this. A is operated on F, which, by the way, we then operate by G, and that spits out C. And then you would say, well, this is just A operate. And if we would write it in terms of notation, we would do A and then F dot G. Now, if we would look at it this, it would seem to make sense. An element, who goes first? F. Who goes second? G. Because it would read like English. But guess what? We program that way. We don't do that in this class. Sorry. So the number one mistake that everybody makes on composition is they get it backwards in terms of operations. Who goes first? Inside. Who goes second? Outside. So example. What if I told you that g of x was equal to x cubed, f of x is equal to x minus 1? What would f compose with g of 3 be? And what would G compose with F of 3B? The easiest way to do this is to not use this notation. Use this notation. Don't use this. Use this. And then do inside out. What's G of 3? What's 3 cubed? And then, so that would be f of 27, which is 26. This is g of, what's f of 3? 
2. And then what's g of 2? Completely different things. Is composition commutative? Pretty obviously not. <laughs> right? Especially if you start to mess around and you have students chairs books. Right? If it's like, oh, let's go. Yeah, that doesn't work that way. The, your domains don't match. Right? You have to line them up so that the sets work. But these were just real numbers to real number examples. Always write this version first to make your life easier. It works inside out. All right. Now that we have our operators, in particular, we have two that are interesting to us. Uh, let's talk about identities. And let's talk about inverses. Things that we do all the time. Again, identities and inverses have to go with an operation. So if my first operation that I talk about would be, say, f plus g, that's my plus operator. For the plus operator, who is the identity? The identity is a function plus what, I'll call it i, as a function of x, would spit out just f of x. What must i of x be? Well, if I would use functional notation, this is f of x plus i of x, needs to be what? f of x. What must i of x be? Zero. zero. And so the function itself, what is the identity function? It's the zero function. i of x is the function that maps all people to zero. What would be the inverse? The inverse would be f plus what? would spit out the identity function, which is just 0. I'll make this a question mark for a second. That's f of x plus what function of x would give us 0? Negative. Negative f of x. What's that? That is the same function flipped about the x-axis. right? So what is the inverse function of addition? Take your function, rotate it about the x-axis. That's the guy that if you added it to the other one would just simply flatten it all out. Make sense? <coughs> do, do, do. Get rid of that. So this would be simply minus f. Now the next operator that we're interested in is composition. f composed with g. Erk. A, the identity. What's the identity of composition? F composed, I'm going to call it I, of X needs to do what? Nothing. That's, that's, that's what must happen. But what is composition? That's F of I of X, and it's supposed to be equal to that. Compare the two. What is the only possibility for those to be equal? I of x equals x. Right? So it ends up being that. Oh, OK. So the identity, I of x, is simply x, which makes sense. This is a do-nothing function. Where does 1 go? 1. Where's 2 go? 2. Where's pi go? Pi. What did it do? Nothing. Under composition, composition is mapping. It maps a thing right back to itself. It has done nothing. That's what composition is about. It's about mapping. So that makes sense. Last one, inverse. What's an inverse? An inverse is a function composed with its inverse, and I'm going to use that symbol for it, needs to spit out what? What's the identity? What does this look like? If this would look like under composition, it looks like this. If this is a and this is b and this is the number x, f maps it to y, but the inverse has to take it back to x. That's the identity. Where did 1 go? To 1. 
That's what the identity does. It's like it needs to go back, go back to where it was. Now, do all things have identities? Sorry, do all things have inverses for all operators that we've dealt with? No, not everything has an inverse, right? Not all things have a multiplicative inverse for numbers. So for us, the next thing that we're going to talk about in class would be, all right, now that we have functions, when does this exist? And can you show it? And can you find it? Things that we do a lot. It doesn't always exist. We'll have to have some types of functions to figure out which ones will actually have an inverse. How do you show it's an inverse? You compose a function with its inverse, better spit out x. And then how do I find it? Well, we can do that for like normal co you know, college algebra type problems. All right. Um, that's it. Or about attendance. Some <laughs> other stuff.